You're listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient, brought to you by University of Kentucky Human Resources Health and Wellness. Join us as we explore tools, practices, meditations, and conversations with the members of the UK community. Together, we will discover how we can thrive at work, home, and beyond. My guest today is Dr. Lance Brunner. Dr. Brunner is an associate professor of musicology and ethnomusicology at the University of Kentucky. He joined the faculty in 1976, specializing in the music of the Middle Ages as well as music since 1900. Dr. Brunner has been the recipient of many awards and fellowships in his academic discipline from organizations such as the American Medieval Academy, the Endowment for the Humanities, and a Kellogg National Leadership Fellowship. He currently is the chair of the organizing committee for the annual Conference for Contemplative Practices for Higher Education, which is being held here at the University of Kentucky from February 29th to March 2nd in 2024. Along with establishing the mindful meditation offerings at UK Health and Wellness, Dr. Brunner is also a certified Buddhist meditation instructor who has led programs and retreats internationally over the last 30 years. Dr. Brunner holds a bachelor's degree from Brown University and his master's and doctoral degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm happy to welcome him to the podcast today. How do you feel about cold weather? I like the the Zen saying, when it's cold, be cold. When Mm. it's hot, be hot. In other words, don't complain. (laughs) Be one with the weather. In the Buddhist teachings about the second arrow, in in, in those days when the weapons were bows and arrows, that if you happen to be hit by an arrow, wounded, the first arrow is to tend to the wound, that you've been injured and you need to stop the bleeding or attend to it. The second arrow is the why me part. Who shot the arrow? You're adding on to it. So when it's cold and you say, oh my God, it's so cold. I hate the cold weather. Mm -hmm. You're adding another layer on it. And that's the second arrow? Yeah. And that's the Zen slogan. When it's hot, be hot. When it's cold, be cold. Be one with it rather than uh, making war with it, which I guess is a type of kindness. Yes, I would agree with that. On the topic of weather, that reminded me of another saying where it said that there isn't bad weather, there's just bad attitudes. Oh, well, yeah. I, I also heard that in Sweden, they say it's, it's bad clothing. You Obviously, a practicality is to, to dress warmly and, and in layers. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, I think, helps the attitude, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, that would make sense. Yeah. So our topic today is kindness, and the title of the episode is Kindness for the Sake of Kindness. In your travels and in your journey so far in this life, what were some of the profound moments of kindness that you experienced or witnessed in the world? That's a good question. Stops the mind. Um, I think reflecting on it, I mean, there, there are so many acts of kindness that have helped us survive so I don't remember or couldn't possibly count the kindness that both mother and father, my parents and family have visited on me or cared for me out of love and kindness, out of motherly love or parental love. And it's a tremendous amount of sacrifice that usually we don't appreciate. Well, first, when we're infants, we're not conscious of it. But then all through our growing up, there's so much that, that parents have to give up I have to put the children first for their safety and for their well-being, and those can't even be counted. Mm-hmm. And I think, in general, as an adult, you meet people who become models of how to be in the world, and people who are particularly kind, even unconditionally kind, become those models that you could say, I wonder how I could get like that, because you, you have a model. You have an experience of kindness I have a life of great privilege because I had 
caring parents and lots of opportunities. And I'm grateful every day for those opportunities. I s- began to search, I guess, once I was here in Lexington, even before, but ways of developing, cultivating. Well, first place, happiness and well-being and realizing that kindness and generosity and gratitude are all part of that. And uh, it's interesting to talk about a spiritual path. It's one of the great writers about religion, the world's religion, was Euston Smith, who wrote a book called, uh, originally, The Religions of Man, I think it was called, and of course it was changed because <laughs> it was not just men. And in subsequent editions, I think it was called The World's Religion. And he studied this, I think he was with Aldous Huxley, the philosopher mm. at MIT, and as part of Smith's autobiography, he wrote that Huxley was one of the world's leading intellects, was visiting with Houston Smith, a well-known professor of philosophy and religion. As they were driving to an engagement, Huxley said, you know, Houston, it's rather embarrassing to have spent one's entire life pondering the human condition and find that I really don't have anything more profound to pass on by way of advice than try to be a little kinder. Mm. So I, lo- I love that passage because that really is one of the fruitions of a spiritual path and that one of the questions that one could ask oneself if your practice or pursuit is fruitful is, am I kinder? I think we're lucky if we are raised in a way that we've experienced that kindness and can be alert to it in our maturity and even our old age. I had an aunt, my godmother, Aunt Dorothy, who lived to 103 years old, Mm. and she had a very difficult life. She was born with one leg considerably shorter than the other. She lost her husband. She lost her son. She lost her grandson, actually, died before she did. And yet she was such a kind and generous person. I I always wondered, how did she get like that? Is one born like that, or can you cultivate that? And I think the answer is probably some of both. Mm -hmm. But my conclusion is that she got that way a little bit at a time, over a long time. Mm -hmm. Instead of knowing with wise understanding that life involves difficulty, it involves loss, it involves heartbreak, as well as joyful things. And how I don't think she said the equivalent of why me, that she grieved when she needed to grieve, and but she had this balance that tilted always towards kindness and joy and generosity despite the difficulties that she had throughout her life. Mm-hmm. You know? So I think all of us can do that, actually. We can do it. It involves going maybe against the current of, of our consumer society that we're in overriding messages that you're not okay unless you buy stuff, mm-hmm. basically. Continuing to consume. Yeah, and every advertisement has basically the same message that you're not okay. Mm-hmm. You know? In fact, I go to the Johnson Center or the Alumni Center here on campus, and I have my ID that, that is coded, mm-hmm. and every time I scan my card, the attendant, regardless of who it is, says, you're good. <laughs> and I've realized that you know, every time I go to the gym, they say, you're good, you're good. And I, I'm starting to think, yeah, maybe I'm good. Like, <laughs> I've noticed they do say that. Yeah, like, you're okay, good. Okay, you're good. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's obviously a, a perfunctory thing to do that you're mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, you, you're a member. You can go, you can pass, but that's just maybe we should at least think that about other people in our daily lives, even if maybe they're. Mm-hmm annoying or irritating or have different views or whatever, but they're a member of our tribe hum, human club. Yeah. Right. Uh, and that there is basic goodness even in everybody in our human tribe. <laughs> That's a Buddhist, I don't want to say concept or even belief, but the t- tenant that everyone has a Buddha nature, that is a nature that is capable of waking up and being in the present moment. Mm-hmm. without prejudice. Actually, that's the purpose of, of meditation practice is a kind of unselfing or kind of mm. willingness to open to the moment to moment, which I think is both a kindness and it's courageous. You mentioned your aunt and how she 
went through trials and tribulation and challenges, yet through this progression of cultivating kindness within herself, she created that attitude towards life, that kind attitude with Mm -hmm. others, maybe even with herself. Would you say she was a big role model for you? Yes, I didn't realize it at the time, but thinking back on it, yeah, she was she was a, just a, a very loving aunt, mm-hmm. and I think when we're very young, we take some of those things for granted. But she was a re- very religious person as well. I mean, she sang in the church choir and I think was nourished by her Christian faith and upbringing. It's just nice to know that obviously if one lives to 100 or more than 100, you're going to lose a lot of people. Certainly your parents would have died by then. And, and in her case, it was two generations, her husband, her son, and then her grandson, who was my age, died of asthma at age 55. Mm-hmm. Very painful losses. Yeah. Yet maintains that positive outlook. Yeah. Positive attitude. Yeah, it's possible. But it, I would say it takes practice. That's a sense of developing positive habits or uh, ways of dealing with the vicissitudes of life. Sometimes it's cold and sometimes it's hot, right? Or, you know, sometimes things go your way and sometimes they don't. You know, there's, I think a neuroscientist have shown humans have an inherent negativity bias mm. and that it seems like when something bad or unpleasant happens, it, it sticks in our mind. In fact, there's a saying among neuroscientists that positive thoughts are like Teflon and negative thoughts are like Velcro. That's to say, the, the, the positive, positive slip away. Yeah, mm-hmm. we take for granted. and The Velcro ones stick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So part of a, I would say, a spiritual practice or a practice of awakening or just of... Or even just trying to be a better spouse or parent yeah. or work Yeah, a better, member. a more balanced individual. Yeah. You know, and navigating the life, it's helpful that we could pay attention in that way of, I think poetry is a really powerful practice to read and write poetry, but that there's so much wisdom or this opportunity to slow down and create space. There's a poem by a man named Stephen Mitchell, who is a renowned translator of spiritual mm. texts. Oh, like Tao Te Ching, Bhagavad yeah. Gita. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Gen- the Book of Genesis. Mm-hmm. And, and he has his own a little book of poetry called Parables, but that it's his own poetry and there's uh, there's a beautiful poem about the Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov was the founder of the Hasidic movement, and he describes what he was like as a little boy. It's a pretty long poem, but that he would be in the forest, and if he found a, a dead squirrel or a dead animal, he would give it a proper burial mm. and say the prayers of meeting death, the Hebrew prayers. And there's a couple of lines in there that's if I can remember them. For him, prayer was a quality of attention to make so much room for the given that it can appear as gift. To make so much room for the given that it can appear as gift. So if you ask yourself, what is given? The answer really is everything. Mm -hmm. This life, this incarnation, this body, circumstances, rather than as uh, an entitlement that we deserve this or that. Or that it should be something other than it is. Yeah. To make so much room for the given. So, you know, I was saying the other day in a class, does anyone have a toothache? No one had a toothache. And I said, are you grateful for your non-toothache? This is a teaching by Thich Nhat Hanh, the famous Vietnamese meditation master and poet and peace activist, it was pointing out that because none of us have a toothache, we don't have to think about our teeth. They're healthy for the moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, you could multiply that by a billion of all the parts of a human body that are working. But if I stub my toe or I got a splinter in my finger, whatever, something little or bit my lip would be, oh, poor me, you know, poor me. So having time to reflect on what is given is a ground of gratitude and I think a source of kindness. Now, if your listeners don't know, there's a website called gratefulness.org founded by a Benedictine monk named David Steindel Rast. 
he argues very convincingly the importance of gratitude as a ground. And even someone like Oprah Winfrey caught on the, is a notion of a gratitude journal. Before you go to bed, you list five, five things you're grateful for. And you can see it could be a very long list, things that you take for granted. So it's a practice that we can do. Hmm. And it's helpful to have some models of people that I'd like to be more like that. You know, I'd like yeah. to be less grumpy and smile more or have a smile bloom naturally on my lips because mm -hmm. I'm grateful. And that's what mindfulness practice does. It allows us to stop and pay attention to what is happening in my body, mind, and the environment. Do you think our awareness ability, our kindness ability, these are things that take practice and they're like muscles that we have to exercise in order for them to get stronger. Mm. Do you think if someone shoots an arrow at you figuratively, your response to that situation, do you think that determines whether or not you succeeded in strengthening your kindness muscle, for example? So say someone cuts you off on the street when you're driving, mm -hmm. that can be frustrating. Yeah. Maybe that's like a five pound weight for your kindness muscle, how you react to that. Mm -hmm. But then let's say someone steals something from you. And then that's maybe more like a yeah. 40 or 45, 50 pound weight. Depends. <laughs> right. It's your phone or laptop. So let's say that you have a kind response or a neutral response to the person that cuts you off, but then also a kind or neutral response to the person that stole from you. Does that correlate to an increase in strength in your kindness muscle? Well, kindness is like a koan. Koan is a Japanese teaching story that doesn't make sense, actually. It's supposed to throw a wrench in your logical thinking that doesn't have a clear answer, like what's the sound of one hand clapping? Well, one hand doesn't clap unless you're Bart Simpson. You know, he <laughs> makes this one hand clap. So in uh, retreats that I've taught, I always tell people to be kind. In one retreat, one uh, woman who was actually on the staff was having a very difficult time because there was a lot of work to be done and she was quite upset. And I said, be kind. And she said, can you tell me how to be kind? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, you know, take some time off, sleep late or do some, take a nap maybe. Is that kind of like a be kind to yourself? Yeah. But then I, it haunted me because that was like my immediate answer. And I thought, if one's tendency is to always check out, like I need to be kind so I'm going to miss my shift at the work because I need to be kind to myself. Mm. That's too simple an answer. And now I say, be kind to yourself. What is kind? And it's not a simple answer because it's relative to where we are on the kindness grumpiness scale. There's something called, uh, I think Gurdjieff called it idiot compassion. Suppose someone had an addiction problem or was like an alcoholic and they said, man, I really need a drink. Can you get me a drink or something? You feel sorry for the person, so you give them a drink and that sends them in a spiral mm. down that hole again. That wasn't kind. Yeah. It was idiot kindness. So you'd have to ask yourself, what's the kindest thing to do? And it's not a rote answer or a given answer. It's like, hey man, I'm not going to, I want to help you, but I know it's not going to help you. Can I help you get back into AA or whatever? How can I, how can we really, the kindest thing you can do? And that's the same thing. Somebody cuts you off, someone steals your laptop. Mm -hmm. I think it's unnatural to say, well, maybe somebody needed it more than me. Or, I mean, I've, I had three laptops stolen over the years. Like one out of my office in the fine arts building, I walked down the hall to go to the bathroom and came and back. It's and it's gone? Somebody, yeah, I, right. I left it. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, the reaction. I think there's a lot of anticipation and fear. I have a, have a whole bunch of stuff on my laptop. It's why I back it up mm -hmm. three, three different places. And if I lost my laptop, I wouldn't lose information. But... Basically, you don't want to lose that, all your work and what things you're working on. But once it's gone, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was giving a workshop in Madrid on entrepreneurship and there were 80 people in the workshop. And I'm usually very careful with it. And there was at least one entrepreneur in there that was there to steal 
phones mm. and laptops. I wasn't watching carefully my backpack. I could say I'm lucky he didn't take my backpack. He just took. He just yeah. or she, she, whoever it was. I guess that me. was kind. <laughs> yeah. So there are in traditional Buddhist practice there are practices called the four immeasurables, which are four different states of mind and heart: loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. And they're like four points on a compass. They're called immeasurable or unconditional because there's no end or limit to how compassionate, loving you can be. Mm. So the, the practice is actually to wish yourself loving kindness, and then to imagine or envision sending that out to people that are close to you and your family or mm-hmm. f- friends or a spouse. Or loving kindness. That, of course, naturally you want them to be happy. And you expand that out to neutral people you don't know. Like all the people in Lexington may be happy to the people who are difficult, someone who may have hurt you or someone who's causing harm. And Why would you wish them to be happy? Along that continuum, there's an, usually an edge to say, well, I can't be kind to so and such a person because mm. what they did to me or what they did to, to humankind. But the idea is not to forgive them that, those transgressions, but to send loving kindness in a way so that person might realize their basic goodness. So that reminds me of this story. Well, it's from a movie, and the movie's called Spies in Disguise. And the main character is a young man, and he's a scientist, and he creates gadgets for like a CIA-type agency. Well, at the climax of the movie, the young man finds that he puts his life after the villains, meaning that the villain was going to die or he was going to die. And the main character sacrifices his life so that the villain may live. Now, the main character ends up surviving, but the villain in the movie for the whole movie, he has a like a fake red eye. And once he experiences that extreme act of kindness, his red eye turns blue. Oh, oh, so wow. that kind of reminded me of that. Interesting, yeah. Where I do believe that, and maybe those are the hardest times, but when we do choose the loving kindness approach, I think that has a profound healing quality to it to ourselves and to others. Absolutely. There's another movie that I saw that was really kind of a silly movie called Secondhand Lion with Robert Duvall and Michael Caine two that, that are older now and they're two, they play two crazy old guys. There was a, a young boy, a nephew I think of one of the Robert Duvall character, came to live with them for the summer and they're always telling these crazy things what seemed like tall tales and... <laughs> But the boy is about ready to go back to the city, and he says to Robert Duval, you, you have to tell me, he looked to him as a wise elder, you have to tell me how I can really become a mature person and, and lead a good life. So Robert Duval says, well, son, there are just some certain things you need to believe that goodness wins out over evil Loving kindness is the proper path. And then he says, it doesn't matter if it's true. You just have to believe it. I thought that was a profound moment. If all day long you're seeing people and you're saying you're good, that kind of comes back to you, I think. And that the, the title of this kindness for kindness sake, there is this reciprocity. There's a, a famous passage in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice that the character Portia said, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him who gives and him who takes. Hmm. It blesses, we would say, they that give and they that take. Sometimes uh, students say, oh, thank you so much for your help like that. They owe me something, and I really feel just acknowledging that it's this great reward. It makes me very happy to help students. You know? You're saying the opportunity to help 
to uh, be kind, uh, others. to yeah. mentor to is the gift for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is a gift. Yeah, That's like the quality of mercy. It's twice blessed. Blesses the giver and the, and the given. Yet somehow there is a way that it would seem to come back around. Do you think what goes around comes around? To an extent, yeah. I think people talk about karma, they don't really understand, they make it too simple. These are things that people can try, like a gratitude practice. You can actually empirically discover that. It's not like something that, that you have to believe, that you're forced to believe. You can just pay attention to how that is. How even smiling, acknowledging people at the grocery store is spreading some joy and kindness. You know, one of the sacred books in Buddhism is the Dharmapada, which op opens with, a, with verses that say something like, Hatred never ceases in hatred, but by love alone is healed. Hatred or violence never ceases in violence, but by love alone or kindness alone is healed. So that's like an eye for an eye. I think Gandhi said an, an eye for an eye would leave a country of blind people. Where does that cycle end? And we're seeing that in the wars that are happening now. Yeah. Is violence a solution? Will violence cease with violence, or is there another way? It's very difficult, obviously. But, yeah. But you can see the seeds of this going back to World War One, I, I guess. Well, mentioning World Wars and Gandhi as well, two historical figures... Gandhi and Hitler, who was kind, who was powerful, and how does true power relate to kindness? Well, that's a complicated question. There's a, a book, a quite a wonderful book called Kinds of Power by James Hillman, the psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, who lists, I think, more than 30 different kinds of power. And he basically wrote the book because he said that's a, a word that people use uncritically. We often mean it in terms of political power or persuasion, but he parses that out to many different kinds. Like one of them is maintenance, like to, the power to renew spaces and things. And I would say that there's a lot of research to talk about vulnerability, that won't, to be vulnerable, which could be seen to be a weakness. Mm -hmm is actually a strength or a power mm -hmm. that you can be touched. You can be wrong. You can lose things. It's kind of a shame that politicians in particular can't be honest. I don't know if you know the name Edmund Muskie. He no. was a senator from Maine who I think was, was considering running for president. And as I recall, someone insulted his wife or something like that, and he cried. He was so hurt by it. He was out of the race. Really? And that sounds like there's a very strong association, not that it's true, but weakness with exactly. vulnerability. Exactly. Well, it is a kind of strength because you're, if you're vulnerable, you allow yourself to be hurt. Mm. They say actually really to listen involves vulnerability. If you're really listening without prejudice or preconceived ideas, it's really a powerful practice, like almost a meditative or contemplative practice to really listen. Because often you'll be talking and I'll think, oh, I got to say this or that. Yeah. You know, like, I've already, I'm formulating my answer. Yeah. Or, or immediately discrediting what someone's telling me. Yeah. It's hard, particularly the, the kind of polarization that's ha happened and happening. It doesn't leave any space for learning, really. Yeah. Not leaving room for what is given. Some people say that attention to really be fully present is a form of love, the willingness to be open. I read just recently that one casualty of tribalism is a lack of curiosity, which is interesting. Because if you say something that, say, I, I didn't agree with, I didn't like, I could say, well, we, we don't have that in common, or yeah, I don't like you. Agree or, to disagree. Curiosity is like, well, why do you think that? Can we have a conversation, really, in which we're both, yeah. you know, maybe we trust each other enough to say that my, my intention is not to, to win, not to say you're wrong. Mm -hmm. 
that's not working, is it? I mean, that people are, uh, they're sure they're right. And it doesn't allow for curiosity to say, maybe you think that and I think this, but what motivates it? Maybe there's some common ground we could find, but not if we were hardened, not if we, we were afraid to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Do you think that oftentimes we shut off our ears or talk over somebody or discredit what they say because we're afraid of how that might affect our models of life and living and maybe even having to rewrite some of the events and the meanings in our lives. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Well, I think it's one thing that's emphasized in Buddhist uh, philosophy or study is that the ego or the sense of self is a fiction. It doesn't exist, actually. You can't find it as a, as a stable, unchanging essence of who we are. We're narrative creatures, storytellers, naturally, in the broadest sense of a story being an account of something like, what did you do this morning? I got up, I went to class, or I, then I, I had lunch, or whatever you did is a form of storying or, or narrative. This is what I did. But the story that we t- tell ourselves is, this is who I am, and this is who you are, and this is the way things are. We basically have the world mapped out. <clears throat> but it's the world doesn't care who you think you are. It's going to insult you time and again, and you have to adapt, as you're saying. The arrows will always come. Yeah, and if you're on a path that wants to loosen the grip of ego, then you should be grateful for those insults. But that's really hard, right? So that's when those insults come in. That's like you're hopping into the gym and you're about to pick up those weights and you're going to be working those kindness muscles, those awareness muscles. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the ego sense is the primary hindrance to treating others with kindness and treating yourself with kindness? Good question. I'd have to think about that. I just got a copy of this new book by Andy Clark, which is called The Experience Machine, How Our Minds Predict and Shape Reality. So he's a neuroscientist in England, and what they're learning is that the brain really is constantly predicting what's going to happen. This is a survival mechanism, mm, yeah. very basic, and, and that actually shapes the way we experience things. And that perception, direct perception, is not, we used to think that it was mostly external stimuli coming into the senses, and he's saying it's actually much more complicated. It's a compelling argument in terms of those of us who are devoted to trying to strengthen our attention to, to experience, quote, reality, Mm -hmm. more directly, as opposed to through those filters of Mm -hmm. what we like and don't like. So actually, we live in a very interesting time. You know, there are these ancient teachings from different ancient civilizations, many of them wiser than we are today. But then with the study of the brain and neuroscience and the understanding of the complexity of our nervous system and our cognitive system, the survival brain and the neocortex, and it goes a long way to explain why that we are the way we are. And for those of us who want to continue to learn lifelong, it's helpful to, to understand these things. Sometimes we're acting or reacting from a very deep place in the brain of, of survival, the reptilian brain, mm-hmm. or the limbic system that were shaped when we were infants. And although We've made it to adulthood and grown up. There's, those reactive patterns are mm-hmm. deeply ingrained. And that's why they, they say that to cultivate becoming a more kind, generous, less egocentric person is not a hack. It's a process of developing habits. In its purest essence, do you think kindness is an expression of love? Yes. Well, I have that koan, be kind, what is kind? Be loving what is love. And I think the commonality of it is, the point of contact is that it's an act of, you could say, generosity or loosening the grip on what's good for me and what I want. So being kind to someone is actually offering to extend yourself beyond your self-interest, mm-hmm. beyond your ego. It's tricky. It's like generosity. If you 
make a contribution to a charitable organization, you feel good that you've given to the Salvation Army or the Central Music Academy. Well, are you giving that because you're really generous or because it makes you feel good? You know, it's tricky because you could say, puff yourself up, say, mm -hmm. I gave so much money or I helped it, this or that. And the way out of that is something that the Dalai Lama said, I think, that years ago a, a journalist was trying to trick him into an answer or something. And I said, well, how do you know this is not your ego? It's just mm -hmm. an ego trip because you're the Dalai Lama. And he said, the purity of my intention is my protection. So it's important to come back to what your intention is, what the motivation is. Be kind for kindness' sake. Be kind for kindness' sake. Yeah, break the grip of ego, but that love and kindness have that commonality. But I think it was said the Palestinian-American poet, Naomi Shihab Nye, is a close personal friend of mine. And she wrote many years ago this poem called Kindness, which is iconic, and I'm sure probably many of your listeners know it, but it's always good to hear it again. And maybe to know that she wrote this poem when she was uh, on her honeymoon in Colombia. She and her husband went to Colombia and were on a bus, and the bus got robbed. It took all their stuff. And there was an, an indigenous person on there who was killed. So those are some of the references in the poem. It really makes the poem even more powerful. But it goes like this. Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken, will stare out the window forever. Before you learn the gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this would be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it until your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore, only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to mail letters and purchase bread, only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Dr. Brunner, thank you for being on this show with me today and sharing your wisdom and insights. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining me for today's discussion with Dr. Lance Brunner. I hope this conversation has inspired you to remember kindness as we go through our daily lives so that we may contribute to some positive impact in our corner of the world and beyond. Thank you for listening to Becoming Wildly Resilient. This podcast is brought to you by University of Kentucky Human Resources Health and Wellness. We offer a wide range of online and in-person services to support the well-being of UK employees, retirees, and their spouses. You can find experts in mental health, personal resilience, nutrition, and physical activity. We're ready to meet you where you are and address your unique needs. To learn more about the work life and well-being services offered by UK Human Resources, visit hr.uky.edu slash well-being. You can also connect with us on social media and YouTube by searching at UKY Wellness or by email at healthandwellness at uky.edu.